Hi, welcome back. Um, I have been away and I apologize for the people who have been watching me uh, on a regular basis. Um, things have just gotten hectic. <clears throat> the um, deadline ha uh, for my finishing this particular robe has, um, has happened and now I have a deadline and so I'm stepping up my weaving project and um, planning and uh, so anyway I've been um, I started my Naheen robe and I'm finishing my uh, Raymond's tail robe so I've been pretty busy lucky and fortunate that I do have uh, apprentices assistants who um, have helped me in in this lower half and um, so I'm all, I'm going 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 <laughs> so um, I left you um, the last week. Uh, I had read a Simpson story, and actually, I didn't finish that story. So um, I'm going to uh, hopefully finish the story today as I weave and uh, read it to you. Um, I'm working on the um, braiding that goes around um, the uh, copper shape. And so I'll show you um, how I braid around those shapes and how I splice. So I'll do that also. So um, welcome. Thank you for continuing to watch. Um, again, I'm Evelyn Vanderhoop. I'm a Haida weaver of the Northwest Coast Chiefs robes, the Naheen robe and the Raven's tail. So thank you very much for joining me. Okay, so we have many braids here around. And um, I'll be first taking the blue that will enclose and border the blue at the bottom of the shield. <clears throat> and I, um, I give it a little bit of a braid there. And I go behind one warp. Now this one, this upper one, is now the action one. It goes straight down behind two warps. And now I have three strands with each one with a warp between. So no strand is coming up at the same place. And then I do my Naheen braid. It's a three strand braided twine. This back one is the action one. It goes in front of the middle, in back of the front one, and down where that front one comes up, and behind one warp and up. And it gives a finish to your weaving. So right now I'm going uh, down uh, step joins here, where I stepped in one warp to create the slant of the lower part of this uh, shield. And I'm going to weave past the lower point and include all of those braids in with that one warp that I went around. And now the action one goes in front of the middle, in back of the front, down where that front one comes up, and behind one warp. And one more. Okay, so I've went past the point, and it's not important to keep that point sharp, so I'm not uh, worrying about uh, making that point sharp, because these shields um, had, a, um, had a specific shape, and so um, out of yarn, this is the shape I have drawn. So, <clears throat> so now it's gonna go behind one. Now this one is now the, the weaver and it's going to go in down straight down and behind two. Okay. And there is the required two warps that are between a splice. When you splice the three strands, when they come in, they meet. You need to uh, make sure that they have two warps between the three 
strands coming from the different directions. So I usually handle my uh, splicing first. I pick up the right-handed side three strand. This back one is still the action one. It's going to go over its partners, across two warps, and then to the back. Now this next one is the action one. It's going to go over its partner, across two warps, and to the back. And then if you've done it right, then this one will go across two warps and to the back and it'll be right at the foot of the three strands that are coming from the left. So now I hold the three strands up and I'm going to take this back one, which is the action one. It's going to go under its partners and across two warps and to the back. Okay, and now this one is the action one. It's going to go under its partner, across two warps, and to the back. Okay, And then this one will go across two warps and to the back. And then you've got a splice where you can't tell where uh, your, your braid ended. And it smooths the shape. So that is what I'll be doing with the black braid, the white braid, the copper, the white braid, the black braid. So, a lot of braiding, a lot of time consuming braiding. <laughs> and that is why some of these robes take a year and the Nahines, they take th almost three years. So, okay, that I'll, I'll continue weaving and then I'll read the story. I've been reading the this story and it was quite long, so I've been taking it in sections and reading it, but it's from the Simpson Text new series by Franz Boas. And um, the story is called The Story of a Stewall or the Meeting on the Ice. And so it starts out by uh, a, fa a mother and a daughter meeting on the ice, <laughs> which is why I'm sure the story is called that. But it really goes on about a Stewall um, and his adventures up in the sky world. He followed a white bear, and it turned out it was a woman. They fell in love, and, but the father-in-law... Um, they were, they went to the up he went up to the sky following that white bear and discovered that it was a woman and they became a uh, husband and wife but the father-in-law did not like um him he wanted to uh challenge him and make sure that uh he was um he was uh, a good uh, son-in-law i guess and so he's every every person that was brought up to the heavens uh following this uh this woman, the the uh, chief's daughter, uh, all ended up uh, in uh, dead. So anyway, they go through a lot of um, uh, tests. He, a uh, Stewall, goes through a lot of tests. So I'm picking up the story at the end of um, his many tests, and the son-in-law. Uh, finally, uh, gets the approval and respect of the chief, who happens to be the son. Okay, so the chief said to his companions, my son-in-law shall go to the fire, make the, him sit in the rear of the house. Then a Stewall went to the fire and sat down with his wife in the rear of the house. So if anybody knows the culture of um, the Northwest Coast, uh, it is the rear of the house where the, um, the chief's uh, family and chiefs uh, are placed in that's where they sleep and that is a special uh, place for um, high standing people. <clears throat> then the chief said indeed you have really greater supernatural power than I son-in-law thus said the chief who is the son to his son-in-law now he liked his son-in-law much and he respected him then he loved Estewal much for some time, he said, with his wife in the house of the chief, and the whole tribe of his father and loved him because he had really supernatural power, 
and he had greater supernatural power than their master. Therefore, all the stars loved Astiwa. Then one day again, Astiwa was homesick for those whom he had left behind on our world. Then he was downhearted and thought how it was. Then he told his wife, after some time, the chief to saw how his son-in-law was, that he was heavy at heart. Therefore, he questioned him. Then the young woman told him that her husband was homesick. And the chief said, the place you left behind is not far, son-in-law. You shall go there. Thus he said. Then the chief showed him the names of the stars and told them to him. Those were the kite and the dipper and the halibut fishing line and the stern board in the canoe and the old bark box. And the young woman was evening star. She was the wife of a stewa. When the chief had finished showing them to him, he spoke to the young woman, O oh child, show your husband the way to follow, that he may quickly go to who he left behind. Then the princess arose and accompanied her husband. And when he came to the edge of the prairie with his young wife, the woman took along four little baskets, one basket full of mountain goat meat, the other full of belly fat, and another one full of fresh salmon berries and the fourth one she carried as a bucket. That was when they reached the edge of the prairie. Then the young woman said to her husband, when we slide down, follow me. Thus she said to her, hus her husband. Then she went down on the rays, the feet of the sun, and the man followed right behind his wife. Then they suddenly arrived behind the house in which the mother of a stewal was living. It was winter again, and the people were starving again. And then they entered the house, and his mother was glad when he, she saw him, because she had thought Estiwal, who was her child, was dead. Behold, he came back with a nice wife. Therefore his mother was glad. Therefore she gave a potlatch again, and she named him with a chief's name, Potlatch Giver, for, she, for he was to be one to give potlatches. And they stayed there for a while. And every morning and every evening, the princess sent her husband again and ordered him to draw fresh water for her to drink. Every time she put a plume of feathers between her ear and her head. And as soon as her husband entered with his water, she put the plume in and took it away from where she had put it on between her ears and her head. And therefore she could drink. She would do so for a while, and then she looked to see if the water was clear. That was how she knew if her husband continued to love her. For a while they stayed that way. For a good while, once when the sun went down, the woman sent her husband again and ordered him to draw water. Therefore the man took a little basket, and when potlatch giver came near to where the water was flowing that he was going to draw, behold, a little pretty young woman saw him approaching. She was sitting on the edge of the drinking place, and then she smiled at the man, and then the man went across to her and embraced her. After he had done so, he washed the inside of the little basket and drew water, and then he returned and placed the vessel with water before his wife. Then she took off again the plume which was standing up, and she put it again into the bucket of her husband. Then the plume was full of something like the fluid slime of frogs. And then she struck her husband right in the face with the plume, which was all full of dirty stuff. Then she arose suddenly, being very angry. Her husband followed her out of the house. Go back, go back to the one whom you love, whom you embrace. Thus she said. Then she went up again on the rays of the sun, and her husband went with her. And then she said again to her husband, Go back, least I look back at, upon you. Potlatch Giver did not mind what his wife said to him, because he desired to take back his wife to his house. He followed his wife, crying. Then she said again, Go back, least I look back upon you. And then both went up along the rays of the sun. The woman went first, and while the man was still going up, the woman looked back. And when she arrived on top of the ladder that led him, up. Then he sank and was entirely gone. Then, however, the princess went on crying. She entered the house of her father. She went in crying. Therefore, her father asked her, My dear, why do you cry? And thus said the chief. Then she told her father that she had looked back on her husband and that he was dead. Thus said the princess to her father. Therefore, the chiefs rebuke the young woman and said, Why were you angry? Why did you do so to my son-in-law? 
He at once took his net, which was hanging up in the house, and opened the front end of the fire to haul up his bones. He put down the net where it was open inside downward, and then he hauled up the bones with all the flesh on them. He put it down again. He did so four times, and then all the bones and all the flesh had been taken up. And then he put them at two rights, and he swung the great plume four times over the place where the dead body of his son-in-law that plume which the daughter of the chief was wearing on her head. Then the son-in-law of the chief was alive again, and they were of good heart. Then the potlatch giver loved his wife again, and the woman did the same to him. So that was the adventure. And, um, and again, part of our cultural uh, elements is, is tucked into that last paragraph um, that I read. It uh, talks about um, the chief, the son, the uh, princess's uh, father. He went to uh, get the bones and he retrieved the bones and it was important to have the bones so that uh, the, bo the man could become alive again. So um, in our day and age now, we are finding that uh, many museums around the world hold our ancestors' bones, and uh, it's very, very important that we retrie retrieve um, our ancestors' bones. We want to continue living. We want to go into the future, and it is our belief that we need to have all of ourselves, all of our body, um, to to be reincarnated and go again into the world. So. Um, where our ancestors' bones rest are very important to us. And the repatriation that is happening in this world in today with indigenous people for the Haidas, it really is a very important uh, element of our culture and our beliefs of, of the future, our future. So um, thank you so much for listening.